Okay, so we've got a run through now of the uh, predicted paper two for the June 2017 AQA star GCC paper released from Pixel and Maps. So, first question on this paper is looking at the value of the fifth root of 300 when it's rounded to two decimal places. So, to tackle this question, you're going to have to grab a calculator and have a look on the screen. So you should see on the screen around about there. So here's your replay button. It's uh, just below that and to the right. So here you should see that you've got a button uh, in yellow. So a button and then above it in yellow you see a box, a tick and then an empty box. Okay, that activating that button is going to let you type in the fifth root of 300. So to activate this button, um, in the top left you see a button with a yellow shift above it. So if you press shift, so the first time you press shift, and the second button, so you press shift, and the second button you press is the button below that symbol. That activates something that uh, should look um, on your screen, it should come up, and look like this. So a little box there, a tick, and then a box there. Okay. Obviously that tick being the square root sign. Um, in that small box, if you move around using the replay uh, button here, so to the left or to the right, um, you should be able to type in the number 5 up here, and then in the big box, by shifting to the right on the replay, you can type in 300, and all you have to do then is press the equal. When that comes up, so you should get the number 3.12913, etc. etc. If we want it to two decimal places, so we want to go, there's our decimal place, 1, 2, so two places after it. So we're going to say it's 3 point, and that's a 9, that means that this number rounds up to. So it's going to be 3.13. So this is our answer. Remember that if this number is and it's uh, 5 or above, so 5 or above, then the number to the left it rounds up by 1. Okay, so if this is a 9 or 8, 7, 6, 5, then the number here, the 2, would round up to a 3. If it wasn't, if it's below, it would stay as 3.12. And that is our answer. Question 2 is looking at a circle with a radius of 6.3 uh, centimetres. What is the circumference circle your answer? So again on our calculator, um, the circumference of a circle is given by the formula pi times diameter or 2 times pi times radius. Okay, just quickly because if this is our radius and the diameter is um, a line from one side of the circumference to the other through the middle, and the radius is just half of that. So two of these radii make up a diameter, hence why two times radius is diameter as well. As we're given the radius here, it makes sense on our calculator to use this equation. So just type in two times, and then shift in the pi button, which is the center at the bottom of your calculator screen. So shift and then pi at the center at the bottom of your calculator screen. It's activate line. So 2 times pi times the radius, which is 6.3. If you type that in, you, sh you should get, on your calculator screen, if it's clever, it'll put in 63 over 5 pi. Very importantly that you remember how to turn that into a decimal. So if you look at your off button, your AC here, uh, just above that and then to the left, you should see a, s a button here that says... S D. Press that, press that button, and it will turn it into a decimal, and that decimal is 39.58, which is to three significant figures, 39.6. Third question is how many seconds are there in a week? Um so First of all, we have to think about what we need to go from seconds to go 
go to uh, weeks. So seconds, then we'll go, well, how many minutes, uh, hours, days, and then you might want to think of it up into weeks. So there are 60 seconds in a minute, and then there are 60 minutes in an hour, there are 24 hours in a day, and there are 7 days in a week. So there's 60 minutes in an hour, so 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 7 days in a week. So if you multiply all these numbers, then press equals, you're going to get your answer, 604,800. Question 4 is um, a bid mass question. So the big mistake that people will make on this one is by calculating 3.47, uh, take away 2.45, uh, pressing equals, getting an answer, and then saying, okay, that times by 1.3. Um, because if you do that, you're going to get 1.326, which is not the, is not the right answer. Um, to calculate the, the correct answer, uh, you should know that multiplication is before um, subtraction in our bid maps. Multiplication is before our subtraction, so we need to do 2.45 multiplied by 1.3 and then 3.47 uh, subtract that. However, um, if you actually just type into your calculator the whole sum, if so if you were to type uh, all of this in uh, one go, your answer would come out to be 0 0.285. So although you might uh, have remembered to do that, so this multiplication and then subtract that from it. Um, if you just type all of this into your calculator, the answer, the correct answer does come up as 0 0.285. Question five, um, getting a little bit more interesting now. So uh, the number 2017 can be written in the form a squared plus b squared, where a and b are positive integers. Given that a equals nine, find the value of b. So this is a solving equation problem uh, which is kind of hidden, not in such an explicit way. So we know a squared plus b squared equals um, 2017. So the number 2017 can be written in, in that form, so that means they're equal. And you know a is 9, so if you type in 9 squared, that will give you 81. 81 plus b squared equals 2017. Now if I subtract 81 from both sides, b squared equals uh, 1,936. So therefore, the square root of 1,936 uh, will give me my answer uh, of 44. Uh, interestingly, if you if you did type in minus 44, uh, that that will give you the same answer because when you square root of this, you can make it both having the positive or negative square root. Um, however, because we're talking about positive integers, you cannot write in uh, minus 44 and expect to get the mark. The only positive integer answer is 44. Question 5b, the number 2017 can also be written in this form. So we've got another equation. This time uh, we're saying p cubed plus 2q cubed equals uh, 2017, given that p is 11. So we can work out uh, 11 cubed and 11 cubed. If you don't know how to do that on your calculator, it's just going to be on your calculator screen. That's my attempt at the Casio screen there. Um, underneath, uh, so you've got shift and then alpha here. Uh, underneath alpha, you'll see an x cubed sign. So if you type in um, 11 into your screen, so just type in 11 into your screen and then press that cubed sign, you're going to get 11 cubed, press equals, and that will be 1,331. So 1,331 plus 2 q cubed equals 2017. Now if I do uh, subtract 1,331 from both sides, that will give me 2 q cubed uh, equals 600. 
86. Now I'll divide by 2 on both sides. So if I divide by 2, divide by 2, to make it just q cubed. Because remember, when, when you have uh, 2 q cubed, if you want to unwrap it, so if you want to undo it, um, you have to do the inverse of bit mass. So uh, as, as cubed would be before bit mass. You would have to um, divide by 2 and then cube root. Okay, so if you try to cube root this and then divide by 2, you've got the wrong answer. Uh, you have to do the inverse of bit mass at this stage. So we need to divide by 2 to give us q cubed. And q cubed would be 343. And then if you cube root that, um, there, is, there is a button for uh, cube root. Um, so if we go back to our calculator, it's going to be the, if I just write this, it's going to be, so it's going to be just hit the shift button. And then if you find alpha here, go two below it. And you should see a, um, a little yellow sign saying cube root of, so shift, then that button, so third one down um, there, and that will activate the cube root, and then just type in 343. And the cube root of 343 is 7. So 7 is your answer. Question 6, looking at the area of triangle ABC. Give your answer to two decimal places. Um, so for this one, they might try and catch you out with some rounding that you do. Um, try to avoid rounding to only two decimal places during your working out. Always try and go to a few more decimal places. Um, and I'll show you what I mean in just a sec. So this is a Pythagoras' theorem question. Uh, we've got a two formula that we should know for the area of a triangle, which is half AB sin C. And the other one is base times height divided by 2. Um, we don't have uh, this angle here, so it's going to overcomplicate things to use that. But we can use uh, the area of a triangle uh, if we know the perpendicular base and height. So for either of these two triangles, we could work out the area of the triangle using base and height. Base times height divided by 2. So uh, using Pythagoras means that this is going to be C, is it's opposite our right angle. And now either of the two sides that are um, shorter could be A or B. So A or B, I've just done that. I could have changed that and called that B and called that A. It doesn't matter. So what does matter is that this is C, opposite right angle. So uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. If I rearrange this, so I get A as the subject just to ease things for me. A squared equals C squared minus B squared. We can do that because we're taking away B squared on both sides. So therefore, uh, A squared equals 11 squared minus 7 squared. And if we type 11 squared minus 7 squared, then our A squared is going to be 72. And now we square root both sides. As you've got a squared to get a square root it so you square root 72 and that's going to give us a roughly 8.49 however if you wrote 8.49 and you used it in your calculation for this you'll actually get a rounding error so you'll get you'll get an answer that will be more like i think it's 29.715 so you don't want to do that instead when you square root 72, you get the number, if you press SD, you get the number uh, 8.48528. What you can do on your calculator, when you've got that number up there, is go to your screen and press uh, Shift, which is up here, and then if you go straight down from that, you'll see a little yellow symbol above a button and that symbol says STO so shift press that button below STO so store it and then choose one of your letters in red so A B C D doesn't matter but I'll choose A so shift store it as A you should have a symbol um, that looks uh, a little bit like 
this, so it says two arrow A, or in your screen it'll say uh, 8.48 blah blah blah, um, is now stored in A. If uh, you now press uh, alpha, which is one to the right of shift, so alpha and then that A, your um, the value for A, if you press equals, will come up. So that means you've stored in your calculator the number as A. If you don't want to do that, then I would recommend taking your uh, value for A as 8.48528. So use, use these decimal places, then you won't have any rounding errors later on. Okay, moving on. So that's A, so that's this length uh, here, which I've just rubbed out. Uh, so we've got A as 8.48528, or you may have called it A. So now all we need to do is type in base times height divided by 2. So you can either type in uh, alpha A, so in clear the screen, alpha A uh, multiplied by uh, 7. Uh, equals and then divide that by 2. So alpha a times 7, uh, press equals and then that divided by 2. Um, instead of a, if you didn't store it as a, just type in 8.48528 times by 7 equals and then that answer uh, divided by 2. And that, if you round it, I'll just clear all the screens here, that if you round it will be uh, 29.8. Seven zero. Note there is uh, in the question. Give your answer to two decimal places. So one of these four marks will be for typing it, putting in those two decimal places. If you put twenty nine point seven, then you have got it wrong. You've missed one of the marks. Twenty nine point seven zero centimeters squared. For question seven, um, you've got. Uh, effectively another another one of those best best buy uh, questions so for this one it's giving you quite awkward numbers 400 mil and 1.5 liters what I would say doing uh, best for me if I want to work out the best value I would turn them into one milliliter each so I'd find out how much one milliliter was um, and then for ease of comparison so for ease of comparison, I would then times it by a thousand to put it into uh, one liter. So there's a thousand milliliters in a liter. So I'd find out what one milliliter was, and then times it by a thousand, and that would give me a nice comparison for one liter. So if we go for, uh, if you haven't guessed already, this side here is going to be my uh, standard, and this side my large. So, I have 400 milliliters in my standard and it costs £7.49. So, the price £7.49, so how much will it cost? How much will it cost for one milliliter? Well, if it's £7.49 for 400 milliliters, if I divide that by 400, that will give me the price of one milliliter. So, £7.49 divided by 400. And that's going to give me a very very small number. Okay, it's actually going to give me if I, if you want to check in your calculator, it's 0 0.018725. If I times that by a thousand, so it's going to be easier to compare. So times it by a thousand. Um, also, that is it in pounds. So that's how many pounds one milliliter is. If I times it by a thousand, that's going to give me one liter, which is 18.725 which is uh, the price as it's money. Let's go to two decimal places, so 18.73. So it costs 18 pounds and 73 pence uh, for one liter. Okay, so nice, easy comparison there. You could have got marks if you, if you compared this number to the one milliliter over here, but it's nice and easy to see it in the pounds. I do the same for large, so I have uh, 27 pounds uh, 99. If I divide it by a thousand, uh, so not one thousand, um, one thousand five hundred, because one point five liters is one thousand five hundred milliliters. 
Okay, so that's the trick for this question. Is this is given in milliliters, this is given in liters. So this square is a string divided by 400. This one is going to be divided by 1,500 because we want to put it into one milliliter. So 27.99 uh, divided by 1,500 will give me uh, how much it costs for one uh, milliliter, which you would get 0 0.01866. If I then times that by a thousand, that will give me um, my cost for one litre, which is eighteen pounds and sixty-six pence. So therefore, which one uh, is best value for money? Uh, well, as eighteen point seven three pounds is greater than uh, eighteen pounds sixty-six. The large can is better value for money, i.e. cheaper better value. Um, very importantly though, make sure that you have your quantities comparable in the same uh, amount. So i.e. Um, I could have compared these one milliliters here, or I could have compared them when they were both one liter. You must have the same uh, quantities and then compare those prices. So this question um, is looking at your knowledge of um, where sin and cos and tan are on a calculator because all you need to do really is, is type in sin 23, note the value, um, and then compare it to cos 67. Um, and then you can kind of, you can see it says even two of them are the same, and it is these two. Um, however, you can, from your knowledge of the sin cos and tan graphs, um, as cos looks like this, roughly, very roughly, um, it crosses at naught, so therefore the value for 58 would be about here, the value for 58 would be about here, well, maybe a bit further along, but uh, the point is the same, they will be the same, okay, in terms of minus 58, which would be here, and positive 58 being here, their values would be the same as it crosses, it's, it's um, oscillating and it is symmetrical in the uh, y-axis. So you know that cos 58 and minus, uh, cos minus 58 would be the same. Um, the other sin and cos would be a harder one to get, but they've made it the first one you would naturally attempt um, to the cos graph. I'll do it again in blue, I'll do something like that, and that's what we really need. Um, we, obviously this is a very rough sketch, it would look nothing like this, really. Um, the sin graph going up like this, crossing at 91, and then going down, uh, yeah, and then again there, that's meant to be minus 90. But this side isn't really very important because we're talking about positive values for sin and cos. So uh, sin uh, 23 would be roughly here, and cos 67 would be roughly here. Um, if this is 90, uh, the point being that what we're saying is this value here would be the same. Okay, so on your calculator, this is roughly the value um, that you're going to be actually working out and if you typed in cos uh, 67 you would find yes that is 0 0.3907 uh, 3112.85 and you'll get exactly the same for sin. Um, if you actually were to type into the calculator though, and this might be a better trick, um, sin 23, and yes this is actually no trick, I shouldn't say that, uh, sin 23 and subtract cos 67, if they're the same, you would actually expect your answer to be zero. So if you type that into your calculator, and if they're the same, then when you subtract one from the other, you'd expect it to be zero. And that is another way that you can test whether or not these values are the same. So we have a another one of these conversion questions which keep coming up in the predictive papers and um, AQA paper practice. 
So very good chance that they're hinting that they're going to have some sort of um, conversion between something like gallons into litres, miles into kilometres. Um, so I would make sure that you're hot on that, on this kind of question especially. So the way there's, and there's different ways of doing this, um, I'm going to show you the way I would think about it. Um, so 6.7 litres uh, per 100 kilometres. Okay, so this is just given for like 6.7 litres for every 100 kilometres. Now we want to turn it into miles per gallon. So we're converting both the litres into gallons and the kilometres into miles. Well, um, what I want to do, as we want um, miles per gallon, um, I'm going to first of all focus on trying to turn um, into gallons first. So I want uh, per gallon, so that's per one gallon. So I want it per one gallon. So what I'm going to do is say, well, how many, uh, what would one litre be? So what would one litre be? And then with this conversion, um, I can say, well, 4.5 or 6, uh, multiply 1 litre by 4.5 or 4, 6 is going to give me 1 gallon. And then from that, I'll have a, a, a kilometre, and I can say, well, okay, let's um, divide that by 1.6, and that will give me a per miles. So 6.7 litres per 100 kilometres. If we divide that by 6.7, that's going to give us uh, 1 litre. Okay, so we're going to divide both of these by 6.7, and that's going to tell me um, 1 litre per, and then keep it in a fraction, so 1,000 over 67 should turn up, and write that down. So 1,000 over 67, okay, so make sure that it comes up a little bit there. So one, one litre per 1,000 over 6. Seven kilometers. Now, like I said before, I want to now turn this into gallons, so I'm going to times it as the conversion is given here. I've got one litre, well, 4.546 litres is one gallon, so times it by 4.546, and that's going to give me one gallon. Okay, so times this by 4.546. that's going to give me one gallon, so times this one by 4.546, so 4.546 multiplied by 1000 over 67 will give me, um, and again, keep it in fraction form, so one gallon, uh, per, and then it's, um, keep it as a fraction, so 4546 over 67. Why are we going to keep it as a fraction? It's for accuracy, and accuracy is so important in this question. So if that's one gallon, what you want to do now is, if that is per kilometer, so one gallon is that many kilometers, well if I want it in one gallon and how many miles that would be, if that's per kilometer, then divide only this side by 1.6. 1.6 kilometers is one mile. So if I divide this number, and I don't need to store it really, I can just divide that number by 1.6, and that will give me 42.40, uh, and then the rest of it's recurring, but it will be 6, 7, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't give me a degree of accuracy, so let's be safe and uh, give it to uh, four significant figures. So your answer is 42.41 miles per gallon. Okay, so just to recap very quickly, um, we, we had our litres per kilometres. Um, as we're going miles per gallon, I tried to turn that into gallons first and convert the kilometres at the same time. So divide this by 6.7, divide this by 6.7, one litre, I want it in gallons, times by uh, 4.546, um, and then times this one by 4.546 as well, and that gives me how many 
kilometers per gallon, you said gallon, not kilometers, whatever. Um, and then divide that distance as it's in kilometers, divide it by 1.6, and that will give me the gallons per mile, or miles per gallon. So your answer, 42.41 miles per gallon. Now, I must stress that you could have got 42.41 um, a different way. Um, a student that I know uh, wanted to do it by uh, ratio conversion, so they did uh, 100 over 1.6 uh, miles is 6.7 over 4.546, and then actually um, divided those ratios, and then straight away gets you know 42.41. So if you want to do it that way, absolutely fine. So we see them as uh, ratios of one and another, uh, but I wanted to show you the step-by-step -step way just to hopefully make it a little bit more clear, step-by-step, -step, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and then giving you the answer. Um, for all three marks, that's the answer. As long as your method is valid to get there, you're all happy. Question 10 um, is, a bit more of a calculator skills question again. Um, so as long as you are typing this into your calculator, and I would I would tend to try and use brackets. So I'd do the square root of open brackets, 3.7 times 10 to the 15, uh, and then all divided by bracket 2.6 times 10 to the e minus 4, close bracket, um, and that will give you your answer of uh, it says two point. So it says two point three three nine five two four zero five times ten to the eleven. So yes, I would write that there, but then in my answer, I'd probably just say two point three uh, four. Really, um, I think you could get away with rounding out to two decimal places times ten to the power of eleven. Okay, if you, if you wanted to be sure um, of all those marks, uh, so that is fine to get you both the marks, but if, if you were in your real exam and you were worrying that you didn't get the method marks, you could just um, type it as the square root of 3.7 times by uh, 10 to the um, square root of 10 to the 15. Okay, so you're splitting that down into those two. Alternatively, you could write 3.7 times 10 to the 15, and you're raising it to the power of a half. So if you weren't sure, I'd write down either one of those two, just to show the examiner that you did know that the square root of all of this is the same as saying it to the power of a half, because this would be the square root of uh, 3.7 times 10 to the 15 uh, over 2. So you're reaching that as well. Um, the second question here, second part, um, we're looking at this seemingly, I can see how this might be quite confusing for a lot of students, um, but there is a hint to which one it is because this is written to the power of 17. All of these, apart from nitrogen, is written to the power of 17. So it is nitrogen, but the mathematical way of knowing that is by converting these other, so if you wanted to check it, these other um, gases. Um, so, for example, on argon, carbon dioxide, neon, and oxygen. And I'm sorry for not writing them in their um, correct symbols. Argon, that would be 0 0.781 times 10 to the 17. So if we wrote them all to the power of 17, then we can actually see that when we add these numbers, it's not going to make up um, a number anywhere near what it should do if it was including nitrogen. So carbon would be 0 0.504 times 10 to the 17. Neon would be 0 0.0182 times 10 to the 17. And oxygen would be at 7.5. 3 times 10 again to the 17. As these are all to the power, to the power of 17, if we were to add all of these numbers, um, 
you would find that 0 0.781 plus 0 0.504 plus 0.0182 plus 7.53 would give you an 8.8332 and it would be times 10 to the 17. So that's how he's got this. He's missed out a gas. That gas is nitrogen. Because nitrogen, if that was written to the power of 17, and this is this is where the shorthand way you might have got it, is that nitrogen, if it was to the power of 17, would be 30.8 times 10 to the 17. Therefore, when you are adding all these numbers straight away, 30.9, 30.8 is much larger than 8.83. So straight away, you can tell that it can't have been added, it must have been emitted. So the percentage of the Earth's atmosphere made up of oxygen. So the percentage is um, a quantity over the total, quantity over the total, times by 100. The big error I think people probably would have made if they did make an error on this one is to say that that is the total mass. Okay, that's what they said the total mass was. It wasn't actually the total mass. So once you've got this, it is a follow-on question, so you need to include nitrogen in there. So what you should do is your quantity is uh, oxygen, so you want to do in your calculator, bracket, uh, 7.53 times 10 to the 17, close bracket, over 8.8. 3 times 10 to the 17, as that was what the total mass was before, so with the emission of nitrogen, but um, add 3.08 times 10 to the 18, because now that is your true total. This was not your true total, it missed nitrogen, so we need to include nitrogen, and we have included nitrogen in our calculation here. So that is the true total, and the quantity is just of oxygen. Press equals in your calculator, and you should find that they are roughly 19.0, I think it's 0, 0. Um, so the percentage of, um, sorry, you type that into your calculator, you'll have a number which needs to be times by 100 to put it as a percentage. So times by 100, and you'll find that it's 19. 0% or just 19% would suffice. So 19% of the Earth's atmosphere is made up of oxygen. Is that safe? Six meters long, instructions approximately 70 degrees at least. Well, you see this angle must be about 70 degrees. So if you can see that um, we've got a right angle triangle here, so we should automatically be thinking soft, uh, toa, or Pythagoras, can we do Pythagoras? Well, we're looking for an angle, so probably nothing useful. Socket toe is the way to go. Um, so if we're concerned for this angle, not concerned for it, sorry, if we're concerned with um, talking about this angle, which I've just called A, um, then we need to think about this side, which we're given, is the adjacent, and this length here is the hypotenuse, telling me that that angle can be using, uh, found using cos. So as we're looking for an angle, when we're on your calculator, if you're looking for an angle, um, it's going to be shift, then cos. So there's your term. So one to the left of that is cos. Shift cos will give you cos to the minus one. And then in your, using your fraction button, so um, underneath shift, you'll see abs, and underneath that, your fraction button, so this one here. Um, so type in, in the top, the adjacent, which is 2, the hypotenuse, which is 6. Yes, you could have used one there, and that will give you your angle. So shift cos 2 over 6 will give you 70.528 degrees, um, so roughly 70.5 degrees. Uh, as it says, approximately 70.5 degrees in the real world, I would say that that is safe. Okay, if you're 0.5 degree out, you're pretty much at 70 degrees. Um, so 
generous three remarks, I'd say. Um, I guess the use, the attempt to use cos, um, the getting of 72.5, or 72.528, and then circling the right one. So for that, we'll say will be all three of your marks. Question 11b, um, we've got a ladder which can be folded as shown in the diagram. Uh, it looks like it is from the previous question. Uh, so leading on, we know that it's a six meter uh, ladder now folded in, uh, into, in the middle. So we've got three meters here and a three meters here. We're also told that this angle that it's made is uh, 50 degrees. The instructions say that it must be placed so that the angle at the top is 50 degrees. How far apart, though, are the two uh, points at the ladder where they touch the floor? So what is this distance here? What is this question mark here? Um, well, straight away, what we can say is this here is going to make up a triangle. And we know that if this angle here is 50 degrees, then this triangle cannot be an equilateral triangle. Uh, equilateral triangles, as you should know, uh, would mean that this length here would be 3. And all the angles, more importantly, though, would be 60 degrees. So as this angle in between is not 60 degrees, uh, we know that this is not an equilateral triangle. But as we know these two lengths are the same, we know that it is an isosceles triangle. And that's important because what we know about isosceles triangles is that two of the angles are the same. As two of the sides are the same length, uh, two of the angles must be the same as well. And it's always the angle which is different is the angle in between the two sides which are the same length. That means that these two angles are the same. We can work out, as they are the same quite easily actually, we can work out what this angle actually is here. Um, as we know the angles in a triangle add up to 180. If we subtract 50, that will give us 130. And as we know they're the same, these two here, x and y, or this one and that one, um, we can divide 130 by 2, and that, if I show you the bus stop method way of doing it, uh, 2 to 6 is 12, so two, how many 2 is going to 10? 5. So both angles are 65 degrees, so I'm just going to leave that 65 degrees here. Now, if we think about we have a calculator, let's think about one of our trigonometric um, ways of getting this angle here. Um, I'm going to use the sine rule. So I know A over sin A equals B over sin B. And remember, with this, uh, as with the cosine rule, um, when we talk about A and sin A, remember it's A is lowercase is the length opposite the angle which will be a. So that means a over sin a means this side over sine of this angle. And then when we talk about b, therefore for consistency we must be talking about this angle being b. And if we want capital C here, then this is lowercase c. So what we're saying here is uh, a length divided by the opposite angle signed uh, is uh, b, so one le other length, divided by the angle being signed opposite that. How we can apply that to the question here? Well, as we've now got this length here, let's call this A, and therefore the opposite angle is capital A. So let's substitute that into here. 3 over sin 65, because that's the angle opposite 3, equals B over sine B. Well, we don't know what this angle is, sorry, this side is, so we can work it out. Let's keep it B though for now. Um, but the angle opposite it is 50, so let's go over sin 50. So we've got 3 over sin 65 equals b over sin 50. Let's get rid of this denominator on the side with uh, lowercase b by multiplying both sides by sin 50. So if I do that up here, that means sin 50 multiplied by 3 over sin 65. And you could have written it other ways. You could have written it as 3 sin 50 all divided by sin 65. But to try and keep it simple, I've just uh, said I'm multiplying uh, both sides by uh, sin 50. That gets rid of the sin 50 as a denominator on this side, hence the b by itself. So all we have to do now is put this into a calculator, and that will give us our answer, which is 2.535, and then it continues, which I'm just going to round to 
2.54. Um, I suggest that when this number does turn up, you write down all the digits just to make sure, as it doesn't say round it to any decimal places, but um, in my answer I just round it maybe to two decimal places just for simplicity for the examiner to let them know that I know what I'm talking about when I round. Uh, that is uh, the answer to this question. So this length is 2.54 meters. Uh, where the marks will be split, um, finding out 65 degrees uh, would be worth one mark, the second mark for correct use of the sign rule, and the third mark for the answer. Now it's important to note that there are different ways of doing this question. Um, another way is to split this triangle down the middle, as there are with many other questions, by the way, there, there are always lots of ways of doing uh, many different questions in the maths, but this way I thought was probably the easiest way to kind of follow. Um, so I could have split this in half and then maybe called this X and then uh, used trigonometry, as I know this angle would be 25 degrees as I've split it in half, use trigonometry, uh, so the sine rule maybe to uh, find out uh, this length here and then I could have doubled it, and that's another way of doing it. Um, but uh, this way, hopefully you'll see, is simple, um, hopefully as well as that way. But uh, that's the answer to this question. So this is multiplying knowledge for question 12. Uh, do you know that if you have something that you multiply by 1, or 1.00, 1 as that's the same, it stays the same. If you multiply something by more than 1, so say 1 1.10, it increases it. And if you multiply by something less than 1, so say 0 0.90, 0, then it decreases it. Okay. As you're multiplying by more than 1, it increases. If you're multiplying by less than 1, it decreases. Now that might sound very simple, but with this kind of question, you need to be really secure on this and also what this means. As a percentage, 0 0.10, which is what I've increased this by, 0 0.10 as a percentage is 10%. So if I was to increase something by 10%, I would times it by 1.1. If I was to degree, decrease it by 10%, I would times it by 0 0.90. Okay, so that's a 10% decrease. Important to know because if I do 1.00, which would be staying the same, take away 0 0.1, which would be decreasing by 10%, that would give me 0 0.1. So if I start on 1.00, and I want to do a percentage change, my multiplier is just going to be take away the decimal of which is that mo that percentage. So 10% is 0 0.1, so that's what 0 0.10, which is why I've taken away 0 0.10 here. Applying it to the question now, if we times by 1.00, that's going to keep the same, like we said. If we're decreasing by 3%, well, 3% is 0.03. So I'm going to do 1, take away 0.03. As I'm decreasing, I'm taking away. So what I need to multiply by is 0.97. So 285 multiplied by 0.97 is going to decrease by amount. Okay, that's how you find your multipliers. Remember, it's decreasing if it's less than one that you're times it by, and it's increasing if it's more than one that you're times it by. And how much lower than one it is is your percentage, and therefore that has a decimal. Okay. Six thousand pounds is invested at three point five percent compound interest. So. Um, to show that after two years the value of the investment has increased. So you need to know your compound interest formula, which is again turning up a lot. P1 plus, now if you want it as R, then make sure that's a percentage, but at R over 100, so the interest rate over 100 to the power of the number of years. So the amount, which is 6,000, multiplied by 1 plus the rate is 3.5 over 100, 3.5, just as the number 3.5, uh, over 100, importantly, um, if you've done it like this, to the power of the number of years, which is 2, press equals, make sure you've written that down though, 
with city plus more and then you'll have uh, 6,200, uh, 400, sorry, and 27.35. And that's your two marks. Okay, so it's knowledge of that formula. That again, it's been tested. They seem to, seem to be testing that rote knowledge um, quite a lot. At the end of the two years, uh, the rate of interest is reduced to 2.5%. So we've got this amount. Um, and we need to compare the value of the investment at the end of five years, um, which has been invested uh, with simple interest. So sticking with this, so at the start, at the, at the end of two years, uh, so after this two years, it's um, then going to be worth 6427.35. So we're going to reuse this formula, but we need to do it for another, it looks like, if it's after five years, and this is after two years, we're going to need to do it for another three years. So it's the starting amount at the end of two years is this. Okay, so we worked out how much it was worth after two years, but the interest rate has changed, so we need to do another compound interest. 6,427.35 times by one plus, and the interest rate now is 2.5 over 100. Type that into your calculator. Um, and you'll find that the value using compound interest you should have got as 6,921.5. So that is your value with compound interest. Okay, so just to recap very quickly, we, we had two compound interests. Okay, we have one with at 3.5% and the value at the end of that is the starting value at the next compound interest change. Okay. Very important that that value is used at the start of the next compound interest period. Now, you need to compare that to five years at 3% interest. Simple interest is, as the name suggests, just a basic calculation. So if you get £6,000, you want to find 3% of that. So uh, times by 0 0.03 will give you the amount which is interest. So 6,000 times by 0 0.03 give you 3% of it, which is 180. So 180 is interest after one year. If it's simple interest, then you're getting that every year. Okay, you're getting that every year. So it's for five years. So what I'm going to do is just times that by five. And 180 times by five will give me 900 so that is the simple interest after five years simple because it's just finding the percentage and then times it by the number of years compound interest you're paid an increasing amount um, depending on how much you had at the end uh, of the previous period so 6,000 was our starting amount plus the 900 so 6,900 is the amount of money we have after simple interest. So comparing them, compound interest is going to be uh, providing you with more than uh, simple interest. And it will be worth just saying how much more. So 6921.55 subtract 6900 it's going to give me £21.55. So you say £21.55 more uh, uh, in compound interest calculation. So I'll just say £21.55 more in compound interest calculation. And that will be all your marks. Question 13 is uh, starting off with the rearranging the formula calculation and the clue as to which x to make the subject is given by the cubed root. So as it says the cubed root here of that, that means the last thing we had to do with this when we were rearranging the equation is cube root x cubed. So that means x cubed must have been the subject of the equation. So first of all, um, rearrange that equation, x cubed equals start again. Uh, first of all, I'll put maybe the 100 on the other side, so 
x cubed plus 4x equals, and if we're adding 100 to both sides, so I'm just taking this and saying I'm adding 100 to both sides, that's going to be equals 100. Now, if I subtract 4x from both sides, that means I'm going to get x cubed equals 100 to subtract 4x. Now I'm going to cube root both sides, so it's going to be x equals the cube root of 100 minus 4x. So you need to show us in those steps, because it's two marks, let's show as many step-by-steps -steps as we can. So I would even write a cube root here and a cube root here, just to make sure that they know exactly what I'm doing. It's a show answer, so you need to really show all those steps. Work out an approximate solution for this. Yeah, use the iteration x to the n plus 1. So the next number in the sequence is the cube root. 100 minus 4 times the previous number in the sequence. So the first thing we're going to do on our calculator is press 5 and then equals. If you press 5 then equals, um, that means that in your answer, so if you look at your calculator screen, the equals is down here. A and S, which is here, A and S, is going to be worth the value 5 now. So all you need to do is on your calculator now press uh, the cube root button so cube root and then input 100 minus 4 and instead of x to the n put a n s type that into your calculator that exactly after doing what we said before so a, not a n s is five press equals Press equals and your first value you should get. So write down x to the 1 is 5. Now x to the 2, if you've pressed equals, you'll find that it is roughly 4.31. And I'm rounding all of these to two decimal places already. Okay, so you might have got different values. But what I'm going to do is as we're giving our answer to two decimal places, I'm going to be uh, rounding my numbers to two decimal places. That way I can see when um, we have the same number to two decimal places twice in a row and that tells me that we've got the answer. So x to the 3, all I have to do now um, after I've got 4.31 is press equals again. Press equals again, 4.36 and then x to the 4 if we press equals again is 4.35. Press equals again and x to the 5 is 4.35. But annoyingly that's in the way. So 4.35 so notice here, I've now got two answers, which to two decimal places are the same. So my answer must be to two decimal places, 4.35. And that will give you all three of the marks. Okay, show that working though. You need to show this working in all these numbers to ensure that you get all three of those marks. In a sale, the price of bicycles reduced by 15%. Uh, its new price is £408, what is the price before the reduction? So classic reverse percentage question because we're given the sale price. Okay, so this, if we've done work on reverse percentages, should be a sitter. Um, if you haven't uh, throughout the year, then I'll hopefully show that it's not actually that scary at all. So with all percentages, we have uh, an original number. Um, we, just, we change it by an amount. And it becomes um, uh, the new. So the original becomes the new. And what we do is we actually multiply it by something. But the multiplied original numbers multiplied by something to get the new price. Now here, as we said in the previous slide, uh, the percentages, uh, if we want to say that the price is reduced by 15%, um, if we times by 1, as you remember, that will make it stay the same. We're reducing it by 15%, so it's got to be less than 1. How much less than 1? Well, 15% less than 1. And 15%, I'll do it over here, 15%, if you know, uh, remember that 100, I'll do it over the percentage, remember that uh, 100% is 1.00 and if you know that 100% is 1.00 then 10% is 0 
and therefore if we want 15%, that's going to be 0 0.15. Note that uh, if that was a bit of a leap, then 10% uh, would be 0 0.10. Okay, I could have put that zero in afterwards. So 10% would be 0 0.10. So 15%, I hope that you can see this quite easily, just 0 0.15. So I'm going to decrease this by 0 0.15. So 1.00. Minus 0 0.15 will give me 0 0.85. So if I multiply something by 0 0.85, then that's going to decrease it by 15%. Okay, so decrease it by 15%. So my multiplier, what I did here, was times by 0 0.85 to get my new price. And my new price, I've actually been told because that's the sale price, 408. So what was the price before the reduction? That's why I do this as a cycle. If you're timesing by 0 0.85 to get 408, then we will do the opposite. We will divide by 0 0.85 to give us the original. 408 divided by 0 0.85 gives us the original, which is 400. 480 pounds. So the price before reduction was 480 pounds. Now I know I've taken quite a long explanation of that, but reverse percentages um, deserves um, quite a full explanation of how we get this multiplier because it's, it's a very important topic um, in terms of understanding your percentages in decimal. So 15% is reduced, so we took off. 0 0.15 as it's a reduction, we took off 0 0.15 from 1, that gave us 0 0.85, and then we're just dividing by 0 0.85 to go back to the um, to the original. So that is our reverse percentage. Question 15 is looking at the uh, cumulative frequency of the time taken to uh, solve a crossword puzzle, we're looking at uh, contestants uh, taking longer than an hour to solve a, problem, uh, a puzzle. Um, so straight away we're given these two blank um, grids and we need to uh, suggest maybe as we're working out the median time, it would be useful as we know that the median means uh, the number in the middle. So if we have them in order from one to say 200 it would be the hundredth person by that we mean the median is the person in the middle when they're in order very importantly but often uh, if there is a mistake then that's where it's made um, so therefore we would work out maybe something called the cumulative frequency okay so cf meaning uh, cumulative frequency and all we mean by that is that we uh, say well it's like a running total how many people do we have uh, here well it's going to be five as that was the start it's five but the running total the cumulative frequency would be uh, adding the next number so five plus 42 47 and then again uh, 47 we're going to add uh, 37 to make us uh, 84 okay so that was 84 uh, add 16 so we're going to have 100 overall Okay, so that was, clear some space, that was 5, then 47, then 84, then 100. So if we want the median time, which class interval, i.e. which group here, 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 or here, as remember that's what we mean by class interval, these are all classes, i.e. groups. Uh, where would the median time be? Well, where does the, as there are 100 people, where does the 50th person lie? And as this is where the uh, 47th, and less than that is below, before, that means the 50th person, as this goes up to 84, the 50th person must lie in that class. Uh, to work out the second part, so estimate the mean, okay, we're not actually working out the mean because we don't have all the data here, so therefore we're taking an estimate of the mean. Uh, we're going to have uh, to work out the, uh, the midpoint, of our class. So we look at our class as we say where is the midpoint and we do 
the number of uh, so the estimated total estimated total whereby we're saying how many contestants were there multiply that by so multiply that by the midpoint because that's where we're, we're estimating that the average person uh, in this interval took the midpoint and then we're saying okay what is that total so five times whatever the midpoint is here well the midpoint here is going to be 7.5 because it's halfway between 0 and 15 halfway between 15 and 30 is 22.5 halfway between 30 and 45 will be 37.5 and halfway between 45 and uh, 60 is going to be 52.5 Therefore, we can say that our estimated totals, which is going to be 5 multiplied by 7.5, to give us uh, 37.5. And our, our second category, our second estimated total, will be 42 multiplied by 22.5, uh, which will give us uh, 900 and... 45 and our third class interval is going to be 37 multiplied by 37.5 so 37 multiplied by 37.5 to give us uh, 1387.5 and finally our last category uh, 16 multiplied by 52.5 to give us 840. So our estimated total overall, if we add all of these numbers together, will be 3,100, uh, sorry, 3,210. So our estimated total is 3,210. Remember the mean is the sum of all our numbers divided by how many numbers there were. Well, in this case, our estimated mean is gonna be the sum of our total times. 3,210 divided by the number of contestants that took part, so divided by 100. That would give us 32.1, and that is how many minutes the mean length of time will be. Question 60, um, density, mass, and volume question. So the first thing we should think is, okay, what's my formula for density, mass, and volume? Density is mass of volume density is mass of volume uh, we have oil that floats is it going to float in one of these things well we've got a spherical so a sphere uh, with a radius of 0 0.38 so let's think about our formula here let's substitute uh, the radius into here that will give us the volume so once we've got the volume and we know that the mass is here the density is just going to be the mass divided by the volume but note that's in kilograms, and if these are in grams, we're going to need to convert them from kilograms into grams, and that's why it's given us this conversion here. So let's start with uh, 4 over 3 pi r cubed, when we know that the radius is 0 0.38, that's just going to be 4 over 3 pi times by uh, 0 0.38 cubed. Okay, make sure that you're doing that 0 0.38 cubed and timesing that by pi and 4 over 3. Uh, that will give us a volume of 0 0.2298 and I would strongly recommend whatever that number is you go into your calculator and you shift store which I showed you earlier shift store and then maybe save it as A again so you've got it as A. So all you need to do is press alpha and then A, and it will come up with that value on your calculator. With that, like I said before, to work out the density, we need to know what the mass is and divide it by the volume. Well, we've been given the mass in kilograms up here, 200, so it's 200 divided by the volume, which you can just type in A, so alpha A, and that will give you 200 over A, or if you want to type in this, but take it as far as you can, um, you could, that would give you a total of 
0.14. Okay, so that is your density. However, as it's given us the mass in kilograms, that is our density in kilograms per meters cubed. To turn it into grams per meters cubed so we can see where it lies, we need to, so that is kilograms per meter cubed, we need to divide it by a thousand to put it into grams per meter cubed, which will be 0 0.87, and that's as far as we really need to go to make this comparison, 0 0.87 grams per centimeters cubed. So our object has a density of 0 0.87 grams per centimeter cubed. So 0 0.7, it will float if it is less than that. Uh, it is greater than that, so it will not float on oil. So oil not float, okay? Less than that, so it's not, 0 0.87 is clearly greater than 0 0.7 grams per centimeter cubed, so oil not float. Water, it will float if it is less than one gram per kilometer cubed, and 0 0.87 is clearly less than one, so it will float on water. So your answer, it will float on water, it will not float on oil. It will float on water, but not that. There we go. So that's our one. Um, the mark scheme for it, um, this is correct substitution to give you 0 0.2289, sorry, 0 0.2298 uh, for one of your marks, using density as mass and volume, and getting uh, an answer of 873 second mark. Dividing that by a thousand to give you um, 0 0.87 uh, will give you your third mark. Um, and a, so 0 0.2298 would be one mark. An attempt to use that formula. So if you plug that into your formula uh, or, and you've written it down, so all you need to do is write down that and you get one mark. You don't even need to calculate it. When you calculate it, second mark. Then your third mark here for 870.14, convert that into grams per centimeter cubed for your fourth mark, and the fifth mark for ticking the correct box, assuming you've got this done as well. So five marks, and that's what it is. A problem solving shape question now, uh, one that we've been practicing um, hopefully quite a lot for the new GCC. Uh, the path, area of the path is to be 50 uh, meters squared. Show that the width of the path in meters x satisfies the equation. So we've got this quadratic that we need to create um, from um, this area of the path. So the area of the path is this space here, which is the, sh the big rectangle subtract the small rectangle. Now, if we know that the uh, dimensions of the lawn, the lawn is uh, four by seven, so four times seven, this has an area of 28 uh, meters squared. So let's work out the area of the uh, whole thing, the, the rectangle, and subtract 28 meters squared. So an expression for this side here is uh, 2x plus 4. So I, I've just added all these together to get that. And I'll just add all these together, so x plus x plus 7, to give me uh, 2x plus 7. I've done this because I know that the area of this path is the big rectangle subtract the lawn. So if I work out the area of the whole thing, the whole of this path, um, and multiply them together, subtract 28, that's gonna be the uh, area of the path. And so if we expand these double brackets, which will be the multiplication of this one from this length, and then we subtract 28, uh, that'll be an expression Zero, and that'll be our expression <coughs> for the um, area of the uh, path. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, equal to the area of the path, which is uh, uh, 50. So from this here, the area of the path to be 50. So our expression for the area of the path, uh, subtract the law, uh, uh, equal to 50. So if we expand these brackets, <coughs> so we get uh, 2x times 2x to give us uh, 4x squared. So 
plus 8x plus 14x to give us uh, 22x and then 4 times 7 to give us 28 and then we have all of that subtract 28 equals 50 so I would um, I'll show you quickly what we did there to get um, this expression here so it's I'll do it in another color as well let's do it in blue so we have uh, 2x and then plus 4 and 2x plus 4 2 times 2 to give us 4 x times x to give us x squared 2 times 4 to give us 8 positive 8 and x 2 times 4 to give us uh, sorry uh, this was plus 7 down here it was 2x and it was plus plus 7 so we have 2x plus 4 this bracket here and then 2x plus 7 this bracket here so 2 times 7 to give us 14 and the x and then 7 times 4 to give us plus 28. Collect the like terms, so we've got 8x here and positive 14x here to give us 22x. 4x squared there and 28 there. That's how we got that. Uh, plus 28 minus 28 cancel each other out. And then if we subtract 50 on both sides, we'll get 4x squared plus 22x minus 50 equal to 0. We're very close to this now, we just need to half everything. Notice these are all even numbers, so divide by 2, and 2x squared plus 11x minus 25 equals 0. And that is showing that the path uh, can be satisfied, the area path uh, with x satisfies the equation path. To find the width of the path, well, the width of the path, if we said here that the rectangular lawn is 7 metres long and 4 metres wide, then this is talking about the width here, and the width of the path here is x. So what we want to try and do is find what x is to the nearest centimetre. Um, this is uh, not, going to, not going to characterise very nicely, so what we're going to have to do is uh, use the quadratic formula. So minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a um, and remember that your a is 2, the coefficient of x squared, b is the coefficient of x, so 11, and c is your term here, so negative 25. Substitute all those values into here and uh, you'll find uh, if you do it with a positive uh, square root first of all, so positive, all of this rooted um, will give you a value um, and then do it again but use a negative square root. So one positive value of the square root and one with a negative value of the square root and you'll find that uh, one of these values will be uh, actually end up being negative. So you get two values for this, once when you use the positive and once when you use the negative, um, and one of them will actually turn out to be a negative value. So if you take away all of this, it will be a negative value which you don't want because the width clearly as is x has to be a positive value. Uh, so one of these values will come out to be uh, 1.5 nine. However, that is not your answer because that is in meters. So one of these answers will come out in meters because you've been dealing in meters here. So the nearest centimeter um, will be 173 centimeters. So 1.729 rounds to 1.73 meters. However, give your answer to the nearest centimeter. So you need to times this by 100 as there's 100 centimetres in a metre, so it's going to be 173 centimetres. Your answers here are going to be for um, substituting into the equation, 
quadratic formula, um, finding that there are two values and getting 101.73 and then finally for rounding it or giving it to the nearest centimetre from the blood mark. Okay, question 18 we're looking at a bounds question so we've got um, the upper bound and the lower bound uh, for a distance and a time. So for the distance here, 1,500 is uh, rounded to the nearest metre, so we'll have to go to the decimals here, and that would be 1,500.5 metres, meaning that the lower bound has to be 0 0.5 below the 1,500, which is 1,499.5. For the time, you have to turn it into seconds as it's tenth of a second, so 5 times 60 to give us 300, plus the 42.4 to give us 342.4 seconds. To the nearest tenth of a second, that means the lower bound is going to be 342.35, because as, a, as we round it to the nearest tenth of a second, we're going to have to go to the hundredth of a second, meaning that the upper bound is going to be uh, 0.45. So we want to find the average speed, well, as speed is distance over time, uh, the maximum and the minimum possible speeds here, using these bounds. Well, the maximum speed would have been given by uh, dividing the upper bound of distance by the lower bound of time. And the maximum, oh sorry, the, and the minimum speed would have been given by the uh, lower bound distance divided by the upper bound of time because that's going to give us the smallest possible number if we have a smaller number at the top relative to the other number and divided by a bigger number relative to the other number at the same time well that's going to give us the minimum value so the maximum uh, distance of 1500.5 divided by uh, 342.35 is going to give us Um, zero point. Sorry, that's going to give us four point three eight two nine four. And we'll do the same for the lower bound here and the upper bound here. So the lower bound of distance is going to be one thousand four hundred and ninety-nine point five divided by the upper bound of time which is 342.45 and so that's going to be uh, 4.37874. So we have these two values where the maximum number if I rewrite it over here is 4.38294 um, and the minimum value is over here. So that means and this, yes, remember, is in meters per second. We've used meters and seconds here. So these are both meters per second, so speeds. Um, the numbers here are the same to two decimal places. As they're the same to two decimal places, so if we rounded this number, it would be 4.38, as this is an A here. They would both be the same. This is a 2, it would stay the same here. So the answer would be 4.38 meters per second. Justify the level of accuracy that you used, well you would then write that it is most accurate to uh, two decimal places as the upper bounds and lower bounds agree here. Okay. If I took it to any further levels of accuracy, so if I went to three decimal places that would have been 4.383 and this would have been 4.379, so it would not have agreed. So this is as accurate as we can get for the speed as it is between the maximum of the bounds by dividing the highest of the distance divided by the lowest bound of the time and the minimum being the lower bound of distance divided by the upper bound of time. Your marks here uh, one for getting uh, one of the lower bounds or upper bounds and the second one for getting all of the lower bounds and upper bounds for time for example third for getting all of them together 
uh, sorry, the third mark for getting um, attempting to divide your upper bounds and lower bounds. Question 19, part A, is uh, looking at a sine rule question. So we've got these, this angle, this opposite side, this angle, and we're looking for this opposite side. So uh, if we remember our sine rule, sine of x over, so we're not going to use that one. As we're looking for a side, it's going to be x over sine of x. So sine x over x would have been if we're looking for an angle, but we just flip them for a side. So uh, x over sine of x equals uh, y over sin of y. So x being the unknown, so it's x over the opposite angle sin 50 is uh, 8.5, so here, over the opposite angle sin 68. Therefore, times both sides by sin 50, and you have x equals 8.5 over sin 68 multiplied by uh, sin 50. Type that into your calculator and you will get your answer uh, 7.0227, which I'll do to three significant figures, 7.02 centimeters. Nineteen B is looking uh, again at finding this time the largest angle, and if you remember your right angle triangles, so if we remember our right angle triangles, C was the longest side in a triangle, um, in a right angle triangle. It was opposite the right angle. Okay, so the largest angle in this case is opposite the right angle. Okay, so why that's the case? Um, because this split is much larger between these two sides, therefore the opposite side must be the longest. Okay, so if you have an angle, which is bigger, for example, then the longest side will be opposite that. If I have an angle which is actually really quite acute, now I have a triangle, so if that's quite an acute triangle, um, this will not be the longest side. Okay, another example, if I have maybe an extreme example like this, a very acute angle, the opposite side is actually definitely the smallest. So there's a relationship here. The side which is the longest is always opposite, and a triangle is always opposite the angle which is the largest. Okay, so the largest angle is always opposite the longest side. So we know then that we're looking for this angle here. As we know we're looking for this angle here, uh, we can now, without any angles, using uh, our cosine rule, so the one which is cos of a uh, equals b squared plus c squared minus a squared over 2bc. So that means uh, cos of a. And if you want to find the angle, remember it's shift cos. So shift cos equals, uh, it doesn't matter which ones I call these as long as this is our a. Okay, this is our a because our cos a is the angle we're looking for. So cos angle, so this must be a, the one opposite the angle we're looking for here. So it doesn't matter which one's b squared or c squared, I'm just going to go 6 squared plus 7 squared minus 11 squared over 2 times 6 times uh, 7. And working that one out, if I remember to shift cos before I do that calculation, and that will give me an angle of 115.38 degrees, uh, which I could round if I wanted to to run this small place to 115.4 uh, degrees. So marks substituting into the correct equation to give you uh, the right angle. So working out the right angle there. Uh, application, so substituting some of these, getting 115 is going to be your answer mark, um, and your final mark, uh, which looks quite generous really, is for making sure, I guess, that all of these numbers are being correctly used, okay, so you're using 6, 6 squared plus 7 squared could be interchangeable but minus 11 squared over 2 times 6 times 7. So make sure for four marks that you're writing down all you're working out 
and if you get your 115.4, uh, then you will be uh, getting all the marks. Question 20 is a uh, similarities question. We're looking at screws that are sold by weight. A uh, table about size A and size B screws. We're given all this information um, up here. With the weight of a bag of screws, these are the same, uh, but the number of screws in the bag is different. Okay, but we're also told that they are uh, mathematically similar. So size A screws are mathematically similar to size B screws. Okay, so that immediately should make us think about our uh, scale factor of length, scale factor of areas, and scale factor of volumes. So what we mean by that is if we have, for example, let's say uh, a cube and another cube which is a lot bigger. Okay, so these are two cubes which are drawn freehand. But we've got cube A and cube B and we're told that they're mathematically similar. That means that each of these dimensions, so this length, say it was um, k, and this length here was um, a, there is um, k multiplied by a number would give us a. Okay, they are mathematically similar. What you could then do with this is work out that that number is a, uh, if we divide it by k on both sides, a over k. Okay, that would give us the ratio, i.e. The, the scale factor. Okay, so we, we talk about scale factors when we talk about similarity. This is important because we find out what the length scale factor is. So we work out what the length scale factor is. Okay, and say that we got our length scale factor, let's say we got it as 3. Well, if you know what the length scale factor is, you can work out what the area scale factor is. And as they are similar, that means that whatever the scale factor is for the length, we times by the scale factor to give us the length of the other one. Well, if we multiply by, um, if the length scale factor is 3, the area scale factor, so if we wanted to work out the surface area of one of these shapes, given the surface area of this, say say it was um, 6, right? this surface area of this shape is 6, whatever the units are, so centimetres squared. Well, the area scale factor is the length scale factor squared, because you're talking about two dimensions. Instead of going in one direction with our uh, length, we're going in two directions, because area is always talking about two directions. It's two dimensional. Um, so therefore, if our length scale factor was 3, our area scale factor must be 9. And if you have volumes of similar shapes, well, the volume is going to be the length scale factor, but cubed. So 3, as that was our length scale factor, 3 then cubed would give us our volume scale factor of 27. Okay, let's step back a little bit. And I said that the scale factor, sorry, the area of this, the surface area of this shape was 6. If you know that the uh, scale factor was 3 for the length, the area scale factor is 9. That means if you want to work out the area of this shape, the surface area of this shape, we would be 6 multiplied by the area scale factor. So the surface area of this shape would be 54. And then if it was centimetre squared, then centimetre squared. Okay, the volume of these two shapes, the volume of these two shapes, if we've got the length scale factor of 3, then we cube it, that gave us the volume scale factor of 27. So therefore the volume, if I know that the volume of this shape here was actually, let's say, uh, 10, so 10 centimetres cubed, then we would multiply, if these were similar shapes, we multiply 10, the volume, multiplied by the volume scale factor of 27, and the volume of this shape would therefore be 270 centimetres cubed. So with our knowledge now, hopefully, of scale factors, um, hopefully that would have made a little bit of sense. It's all about finding um, the length scale factor or finding some sort of way of comparing similar shapes. So if we've got a volume scale factor, what we would do with that 
if you've got the volume scale factor to go back to, for example, the length. If you know that the volume um, has a scale factor of a, so there was there was a difference of eight for it, then we would find the the cube root of a, and that would give us the length scale factor. So the length scale factor would have been two, and then you could work forward. So two squared is four, so the length scale factor squared is that, the length scale factor cubed is this, so 2 cubed would give us 8. So with all of that, let's try and tackle that quite this question, and I apologise if um, that was quite a lot of detail for uh, the start of a question, but it's important that similarity is understood well because um, it's proportion and similarity and uh, ratio, all things that are now work, make, working up to be at least 20% of the exam. So size A screws are identical to each other, B screws are identical to each other, so therefore we've got um, number of screws in the bag being 60 and number of screws here being 50, uh, sorry 100, so what we'd actually have here, so let's say A and B, so we've got our, our two different sizes, size A and size B. So size A, there are uh, 60, and size B, there are 100. Okay, what this means is that the volumes of these shapes, as they are given the same weight, these volumes are going to be different. In fact, size A, because there's less screws for that weight, volume, the volume of A is actually going to be um, larger than the volume for B. Okay, that way uh, their, their mass, their, their overall combined weight, even though they ended up being the same, for less screws, the volume is actually larger. So you can actually say that um, to get those 60 screws compared to the 100, well, that's going to be in the ratio 5 to 3. Okay, so we simplify, we can simplify 60 to 100 uh, down to being... Uh, divide by 20, divide by 20, and it's going to be uh, 3 to 5. Okay, but we know that um, it's not going to be 3 to 5 here because the volume of A, as there are less of them, is going to be bigger than for B, so sw switch those numbers around. So even though they're in that ratio, and you can actually reverse it because just common sense is uh, going to suggest that uh, as there's 60 screws for A, that's going to have uh, therefore, if you're talking about the volume, then A must be larger than B because there's uh, less of them to fill up that, that weight. Once you've got over that, uh, I guess, kind of a leap of faith, you've actually got um, a decent chunk of the weight there for this question. So we're going to end up looking for the length of one screw. So if we've got the volume and we know that it's 5 to 3, then let's just think about what this means. Um, so the, the volume of screw A and B must be related. Well, the volume of screw B, volume of screw B must be three fifths the volume of screw A. Okay, so looking at this ratio again, um, we can work out what B is by having whatever A is and multiplying it by three-fifths. Okay, that's in terms of volumes, that's how we could work out the volume of these and let's um, put that into practice. And we're not saying here uh, that, you know, if we substituted these in here, then we're not talking about these values being the volume. Okay, this is just the number of screws in the bag. We're talking about the actual volume of it. Okay, so although this would work if this was A equals 5 thirds of um, B, um, we're not actually saying with the number of screws here. Okay, although they are inversely related, so if we did say uh, that, it would actually end up being 100. The volume um, scale factor, then, if we know that uh, the ratio of the volumes is going to be 5 to 3 here, so we know the ratio of A being 5 to B being 3 is that. Remember what we did earlier, and if we want to find, as we're looking for the 
the length of one other screw, then we know that as this is the scale factor for uh, the volumes, we are going to bypass area and we're going to cube root, because if we cube root the volume scale factor, like we said um, earlier in the video, we cube root the volume scale factor, that's going to give us the length scale factor LSA. So we're going to cube root both of these. And so the cube root of 5 to the cube root of 3 is the ratio for the length scale factor. It's meant to be two dots here. Okay, colon. Uh, so therefore, the cube root of 5 to the cube root of 3 gives us the uh, ratio A to B. Well, with that, as we know uh, now the uh, scale factor, what we can do is say, well, to work out the length of screw B, B, screw B, is going to be our length scale factors, so the cube root of uh, 5, cube root of 3 over the cube root of 5 uh, multiplied by whatever A was and we know that A is given here as 4 so the cube root of 3 divided by the cube root of 5 so our, our length scale factor uh, multiplied by 4 is going to give us b and b therefore is going to be uh, 3.3737 uh, which if we put to three significant figures it's going to be 3.37 so 3.37 centimeters okay the final question now on the paper is a uh, growth and decay question the, using this formula here uh, note t equals the number of months so straight away the population will have grown more than that is he correct well he says that by then so after that time the number of months is 12 so from the 1st of January all the way to the 31st of December that's 12 months Therefore, is the population greater than 2,000? Well, if the population is given by 600 times by, and then this up here, 2 uh, to the power of 0.5t, it will be times 2 to the power of 0.15, sorry, 0.15t, so 0.15 times by 12, as instead of t, you've got 12. So make sure you've written this down, uh, type it into your calculator uh, with your power button and it will say if you work that out um, it's the same as 600 times 2 to the power of uh, 1.8 uh, which is 2089.32 uh, as we're talking about the number of rabbits in a forest that's 2089 so that is the population and 2089 is greater than 2000, therefore um, he has got it correct, and those are your two marks. So one mark for the right box being ticked, and a justification, as it's the end of the paper, you'll only really get that if you've worked out the answer of uh, population being 2089. So the key here is understanding that T is talking about months, and therefore it's going to be 12, and then substituting that into the equation. Okay, I hope you found this useful, um, and I'll be back with another video very soon.